So welcome to the second part of the lecture. In the second part of the lecture on conditional compilation, we want to have a look how we can realize the vision of compile time features uh, in a more fine granular uh, manner as we've seen this with build systems. So with build systems, we looked at compile time variability that is uh, customized based on the feature selection. So this is close to our vision, but still we will see that this is a very, uh, uh, yeah, not the right granularity that we are looking at. And that's why we uh, introduce preprocessors here as a more fine grained technique. To give you some more details, what do we mean by granularity of variability? Um, depending on the implementation technique, variability can be introduced at different kinds of uh, levels of granularity. The level of granularity refers to the hierarchical organization of the implementation artifacts, for instance, in the file system or the hierarchical structure of an implementation artifact given by its syntax. So in most cases, this will be uh, meaning that uh, there is some hierarchical organization uh, into packages, folders, uh, and files. But there's also some structure that we have within files where we have some <coughs> a given, excuse me, a given structure in the uh, syntax. So if we look at Java, we do have different uh, levels of granularity here. We have modules and libraries. Uh, we can also have certain packages and classes. Uh, we have members, statements, and parameters. So, and what we've seen so far uh, as levels are different techniques. And we will now have a look at what is the kind of granularity supported by those techniques. We looked at clone and own. Clone and own by means of, for instance, version control, but could be also without version control, where we have coarse-grained variability. So this means we can only clone and adapt complete variants. We always need to take all the artifacts that make up the project and create a new clone out of this. So this is very coarse-grained variability. We do have a slight, we've, had, we've seen slight improvements when we were starting to use clone and own with build systems. The reason is that we have some available uh, operations that can work on file level. So this is why we consider this as medium grained variability. We also looked at features with build systems in the last part of the lecture, in the first part of the lecture. And uh, in this part, we have seen that we can also use our feature selection to include some files and exclude some files. But this is, again, the same uh, uh, level as we've seen before. This is the level of files. We, in the second lecture, in the third part, we talked about design patterns, design patterns for variability. How can they be used to support the vision of software variability, and how can they support uh, variation. And in most cases, these design patterns help us to get variability in terms of classes, in terms of members that could be added. If you think of the template method pattern, we looked at hook method, for instance. So uh, a hook is envisioned at a certain position, and then we can refine that hook method, provide another implementation, and the overall algorithm does something else. We've also seen other uh, uh, design patterns like uh, des design pattern of decorators, where we introduce some new decorators, some new classes. And this is, again, medium grained variability. Uh, it's slightly uh, below file level, but still, in most cases, this is uh, related to class or member level. So this is very similar to the other levels mentioned before. And we have seen already fine grained variability. So this was the first technique that we looked at runtime parameters or runtime options. And over here, uh, we can have even go to statement level variability. So, but still, what is missing 
Missing is an approach that supports at the same time fine-grained variability and compile time variability, right? So we've seen fine-grained variability as with runtime parameters, uh, with runtime uh, variability, uh, and uh, the other techniques are typically more coarse-grained uh, options for variability. And we will now look into preprocessors. Preprocessors fill this gap uh, and they allow us to have fine-grained variability by manipulating the source code before compilation. So that's why they're called preprocessor processor for processing the source code, the artifacts, and pre stands for uh, actually prior to uh, this is used uh, processing the text processing prior to the compiler. So preprocessors have. Uh, several different use cases. They are used to inline files. If you look at the C world, then we have header files, and uh, the header file is included then in the C file. Uh, we can use them to define and expand macros. So we can use meta programming. We can have functions that can manipulate the source code before we compile it, and we can use it for conditional compilation. And that's again the title of this presentation of this lecture. Also, the idea of conditional compilation is that we include some parts of the source code or not, depending on some uh, flags that we give to the preprocessor. So uh, when it comes to preprocessors, we always need to talk about the C preprocessor. It's uh, used in almost every C or C++ project. So the notion of preprocessing is uh, is uh, known to uh, developers in C or C++ world. Uh, processors, preprocessors are typically oblivious to the target language. So they could also be in principle used for Fortran or Java, even the C preprocessor. But uh, uh, we will see later on that there are some slight variations that we sometimes uh, do because um, these preprocessor directives and statements are typically written in uh, comments, and uh, we do have different signs for comments in different languages. Conditional compilation is a very common technique to implement product lines in practice. Uh, this is used in many situations, and even in, in, in situations where we're not talking about variability uh, in the sense of different feature combinations and different customers and different products that we sell, but also in terms of a debug flag and some uh, options that are only used for development. So how does the C preprocessor work? So we have a small example over here. It's a Hello World program. And the idea of this program is to print Hello World, but in different ways. So we can uh, decide based on the feature selection um, which words are actually um, printed out. So we have different um, directives in the C preprocessor. These are uh, commands, keywords to uh, guide the preprocessor uh, on the preprocessing. So, for instance, we have the include command, which basically says we can include a certain file here, for instance, a header file or a library. Uh, we have text replacement, so we can say whenever you find uh, a variable named hello, replace it by true. So, and that's what the preprocessor does. So, if the preprocessor processes a certain file, it will replace the occurrence of hello by true. And these define and also undefined statements um, can not only be given in the source code, but also as command line parameters to the preprocessor itself. We talked about command line parameters. That's a bit confusing because they are used for the preprocessor itself here. And then we have conditional compilation. So we have certain parts in the code, like this if statement over here, where we say, if did, uh, this uh, term, uh, this expression evaluates to true, then include the following nine and otherwise not. So we have the, the statements if and end of here, but there are many more for conditional compilation, uh, as we will see in a minute. But before we uh, will have a look at the output for this uh, for this program. So we have, uh, we can look at the result that the preprocessor uh, gives us. 
So this is uh, the program on the right hand side. It's a simplified version of the output that we will get if we give this example input to the C preprocessor. So the idea here is as we selected hello, beautiful and true, we will have the words hello, beautiful, uh, excuse me, and world. Um, and we will basically uh, get these statements from the following lines over here. And there's a slight mistake. You might have recognized this. So these are supposed to be small letters. So why is this a simplified view? Uh, a preprocess file can get very long due to included header files. So we have an include statement over here, which might give us some additional code on top of the file. And preprocessors typically do not remove line breaks. And the reason for this is that once we receive a compiler error on the generated output, uh, we can easily map it back to the original input uh, or more easily at least um, when we use the same line breaks. But there are more statements that we can use. We can have else constructs. Uh, we can have elif constructs for combining else and if. Uh, we can have uh, if devs. So this is actually known, uh, a very common term in the community when it comes to C preprocessing and conditional compilation, because in many cases we are not interested in the actual value, but it's sufficient to just write define and write nothing afterwards. And then we can check with if dev hello whether this feature is defined or not. And of course, we can also do the other way around. Only if a feature is not defined, then we do something. And there are some new constructs even. So the C preprocessor is even uh, changing. The syntax is changing over time. So there are some new constructs like elifdev and elifnotdev. So there are also preprocessors for other languages. In principle, a preprocessor can be used for any textual language, uh, but uh, uh, the it's, it's often the case that we want to have those preprocessor statements in uh, special commands because then we can more easily use other tools out there uh, for the processing, for working with those files, like a Java editor, an IDE, or something like this. And that's why there are also particular preprocessors for Java. So for instance, Munch, this is a very, uh, very small uh, preprocessor. It's a preprocessor written in Java and also for Java code. Uh, it has only about 300 lines of code. So it's, it's fairly simple. And uh, the way how we can use it uh, is we can call the preprocessor. We can specify all those features that are selected, which in the example above were the features hello, beautiful, and world. And then we say, uh, this is the file that we give as input, and this is the target here. In this uh, directory, we are expecting the output, the processed file. So, and over here, we see the syntax. Uh, the syntax is slightly different than from the C preprocessor, but it's very similar still. Uh, so we can have these if statements, and for these if statements, we can then use refer to some features, and those features will be defined or not defined based on the command line parameters of the preprocessor. And again, the output is a new file. And we do have some line breaks, as we can see over here. right? So the line breaks uh, somewhere here in the file are not removed. And this has the advantage if we get a compiler error in one of the lines, uh, we can easily trace this back to the original line in the source code. There's another preprocessor for Java source code um, that uh, is, was a bit more used, uh, at least in, in days when Java micro edition projects were very popular. Uh, it's also written in Java. It's written for Java. Um, and the difference of this preprocessor is that it is an in-place preprocessor. So both Munch and um, the C preprocessor that we've looked at earlier are preprocessors that take an input file and produce a new file's output. And instead of uh, producing a new file, Antenna will actually work on the same system and only comment out certain lines. So first of all, the difference is that all the uh, directives for the preprocessor will remain in the source code. And we have special symbols that the uh, preprocessor knows which 
commands uh, which uh, commands uh, command signs have been introduced by the preprocessor itself. So we do have these two options for preprocessing in general. We have in-place preprocessors where the input file is manipulated, as we've seen this for antenna. So the lines are commented out where not necessary. And our experience with building tool support for preprocessors uh, in feature IDE, as we will see later on, is that uh, the tool support is typically better if you have in-place preprocessors at hand, because then the compiler will actually look at the same file that you're editing, and this gives some additional support for editing. But there are also uh, uh, other kinds of preprocessors, and we will call them in this lecture out of place preprocessor, where a separate output file is generated, uh, lines are deleted uh, where necessary, and uh, the uh, support for such lines is typically not that good because you can imagine uh, you will get content assist and refactoring and other functionality based on a generated file, but you actually want to edit this file. So there's sometimes some confusion in the IDE. Uh, we can use uh, preprocessors in our tool support and feature IDE where we started uh, many years ago um, as a research prototype, as a prototype to be used specifically for a lecture on product lines. And the idea was that people do not have to, uh, and students do not have to work with the preprocessors on command line, but they can rather use them uh, within the IDE. So there's support for creating uh, uh, features in a feature model. Uh, there's support for creating features uh, and there's support for uh, preprocessing the source code and also analyzing the source code. So for instance, over here, we do have an error message saying that a certain feature is not defined in our feature model. So over here, we just have a typo uh, so that the E, uh, the e um, is missing here uh, because it's misspelled. So there's a video. Uh, we will put the, the link on top uh, here on YouTube. And then uh, you can have a look at the demo video. Uh, the first two minutes are relevant for this part of the lecture. Yes, yeah, so the other features that we can have here, for instance, the content assist uh, that helps us to understand which features we can call within the source code. So now we want to discuss how well do preprocessors support our vision of product lines? What are their advantages and disadvantages? And preprocessors are very powerful. We can annotate complete files, complete Java classes. We can annotate certain members like fields and methods, statements, or even parts of statements. We can annotate certain parameters. We can even annotate single characters with preprocessors. And then we can automatically generate variants. And this is, uh, as envisioned in the idea of product lines, we can make a descriptive selection of features. And based on these features, we generate the resulting source code. So, and in this case, uh, we have our graphs with uh, weights and with directed edges. And uh, we can, uh, if we not choose directed, if we choose weighted and not choose optimal connection, then we arrive at the following source code. So everyone happy? I will give you a brief moment to look at this example more carefully to see that you can see whether you can spot any problems with this course source code. So in the source code, you might have spotted some problems already, or you can even pause and think about it again for some more time. And in the next slides, I will guide you through a couple of errors that we put in there uh, on purpose. But in practice, this happens frequently also, uh, all these kinds of errors that I'm showing here. 
So for instance, there's a syntax error. Uh, in this case, we do have uh, an opening bracket, but the closing bracket is uh, not available. And we are also missing the semicolon here, right? So these two signs are basically missing here and the compiler will complain about this. So the compiler will actually do the processing. It will try to pass this class, um, this textual representation into an abstract syntax tree, into a tree representation internally, but it will fail to do so at least for parts. So it will probably ignore uh, this statement in here. And uh, uh, you cannot, uh, in, in, in most cases, you will not be able to compile this program. Uh, so there will be no result for this particular configuration. So preprocessors are powerful, but can produce syntactically ill-formed programs. Uh, errors may appear only for certain configurations. So we've seen one configuration where there was no problem. And for other configurations, we might have syntactically problems uh, that are hard to find and uh, that are more likely than for every other technique that we can use to implement software product lines, as we will see later on. We will see some more uh, of those problems in the last part also of the lecture. But there's also another problem even with that example. And uh, we do have a statement here saying that weight should be assigned uh, the value of E weight, uh, but weight is actually not defined. So there's no weight over here. And that was on purpose because weight was not selected. But obviously, there is some problem with mapping from features to source code. So some mapping is probably missing here, where we say that this part of the source code, this part of the statement, is not needed in all those cases. So again, preprocessors are very powerful, but they can produce not only syntax problems, but also ill-typed programs. So this is a problem of a type error. So and again, these errors uh, might appear only under certain configurations. Uh, they are, again, hard to find. And it could be, and there are uh, examples that of such type errors that um, were existent in the Linux kernel for several years until someone hit them by accident. We will talk about this in more detail in the lecture number 10, where we look at how to find statically uh, or statically find such problems. But we do have also problems uh, of that occur someone at runtime. And uh, maybe you spotted all of the three errors uh, when looking at the source code, but probably only some of them. So this is a very subtle error that we introduced. So over here, we introduce, uh, is int introduced an error where uh, the wrong um, edge, the wrong node is actually compared with each other. So we do have a failing assertion over here because of this problem. So again, preprocessors are very powerful, uh, but uh, we might have some unwanted behavior. And again, there will be a lecture on uh, introducing how to find uh, problems that are only occurring at runtime. We have other problems besides those problems mentioned already, and uh, something that is uh, specifically uh, hard for such preprocessor code, or might be hard depending on how extensively uh, we uh, use the preprocessor, uh, is that it can be hard to read. And I will give you a moment to inspect the source code over here. So what we can see from this example is that we have even more statements uh, for the preprocessor, more preprocessor directives than the actual code. Uh, the actual code is even in some parts uh, yeah, uh, hard to read because uh, there are many of, the, of such uh, directives. Uh, and there might be even parts here, uh, additional lines of code. This could be hundreds of lines of code. And this is actually closed somewhere 
over here. Or it could be even that some end of somewhere is missing and actually I've uh, even made a mistake because this uh, gives us first uh, the elif and then we will get uh, to the end over here. So it's not that easy to see this. It's not that easy um, to understand the nesting of those different um, preprocessor directives. And also we're mixing two different languages. We are having a host language, a language where we write our programs in. This could also be different kinds of languages, for instance, C or Java. And then we have if devs or other directives, uh, the language of the preprocessor, and these two are mixed. And the control flow is very hard to understand. It's hard to understand uh, where certain parts uh, are ending uh, because there's no indentation for the if devs. Uh, we could use indentation for the if devs, but then it must have been a, a different one than the indentation that we would use for the source code to understand the control fund and also understand the nesting. In some cases, we might have some additional line breaks necessary to understand the source code we've seen over the examples in the previous example of the graph library. So in particular, um, the problem is even worse when it comes to undisciplined annotations. So what does it mean? The preprocessor language does not care about the preprocessed language. So it's just consuming a piece of text, a character stream, and then it produces a new output, which is again a character stream. So it allows for undisciplined usage, uh, which means that we, are, we can annotate every single char somewhere, uh, somewhere in the program. There, there's a special syntax to even uh, uh, have some uh, single chars in a certain line uh, connected uh, or annotated uh, for most of the preprocessors. And this even makes readability worse. So you could even say that um, the, that a certain part, for instance, like uh, that prefix over here is only available if a certain uh, feature is selected or not. So we want to briefly discuss preprocessors and how they how well we can use them for uh, implementing software variability. There are some advantages. These are well-known and mature tools. Uh, they are really available and they are used by developers, especially in embedded uh, system development anyway. They're easy to use. We just annotate and remove certain parts of the source code. We support compile time variability, so uh, we can avoid all the problems that come with shipping out more software than is actually needed. We have flexible arbitrary le levels of granularity. This can mean that we can uh, wrap a certain, a single character, a single method, a single parameter somewhere, but also uh, complete files or even include statements. We can handle code and non-code artifacts in the same manner. So we can even have a uniform processing of different kinds of artifacts in the same system, uh, especially if they are just text-based uh, formats, uh, we can use a C preprocessor for any text-based file out of the box. There's little pre-planning uh, required for this technique, and we already mentioned this over here. We will see that some of the later techniques require some more pre-planning, uh, some more upfront uh, planning. We can introduce variability into an existing project. We can introduce variability at any particular point. Uh, in the program. But there are some challenges with this. We already talked about scattering and tangling. Uh, where do I find all the implementation of a certain feature? This is hard to see, as we will also discuss in the next part of the lecture. It mixes multiple languages, languages to implement the host artifact, uh, but also um, uh, the language of the preprocessor are mixed in between, and uh, it's hard to uh, find a good way of structuring this uh, that, and it's, it's kind of impossible to do a good structuring like indentation that fulfills the needs for both kinds of languages. 
It may obfuscate the source code severely uh, and such as such impact its readability. It may be hard to analyze and process for existing IDEs. Imagine there's some source code, even with the antenna preprocessor that is uh, outcommanded, so that is not visible to the compiler or IDE. And uh, if you rename something, it uh, will basically ignore all comments. So basically also all alternative features, there will be always some code that is not reflected by the integrated development environment. Preprocessors can easily be applied, but this also means they're often applied in an ad hoc or undisciplined fashion uh, where it's even harder to understand the source code and it's uh, the preprocessor based product lines are prone to subtle syntax type or runtime errors which are hard to detect and we will talk about this in more detail on how to detect them and what are the different kinds of errors feasible later on i would like to uh, close this part of the lecture with a brief overview on some projects that have been studied in the uh, systems domain especially uh, these are all systems that are developed with the C preprocessor. And the question is, how large are these pro uh, projects in practice and how many features do they have? So what we can see here is that there's kind of a correlation here that the larger the system, so system with up to 10 million lines of code, uh, that they do have something like 10,000 um, 10, features. And the larger uh, the systems are, the more features they have. So we will not see uh, systems with more than 1 million uh, of co uh, lines of code uh, that are somewhere here that only have like 10 or 100 of features. And on the other hand, it's very unlikely if we look at very small systems that we uh, have only uh, that we already have a very high number of features. Uh, we can also look at it from a different perspective. If we look at the different systems uh, in terms of their size, we can see what is the percentage of code that is actually variable and how much of the code is common to all those products. And we see this is there's not a direct correlation here, but we do have certain systems um, uh, in different kinds of sizes and the variable code uh, varies a lot among those uh, different products and uh, among those different systems. Then we can also see uh, the more features we have in the source code, uh, the more variable code we have. So the other one was like a percentage of the variable code, but the more variable code we will have on the other hand. So this is kind of a, a correlation that comes from the other two pictures together. And then we have the average nesting depth. We already talked about if devs and if devs can be nested inside each other. So we can have if dev, if dev, elif, uh, some, some kind of nesting. And the average nesting depth uh, gives us a kind of a measurement. Um, how, what, is the, uh, what is the nesting depth that I can typically uh, look at in the source code when I take a, a particular position? And we can see that the nesting depth is almost um, independent of the size, but uh, rather different for different kinds of projects. And then we can look how often a feature is referenced in the source code, uh, how often a feature is, uh, is referenced in the source code. And we do see that features are referenced at different positions. They are uh, uh, referenced uh, uh, a certain number of time. And this is just giving us the average. It doesn't mean that there's no feature that is, uh, that is I mean, there are features that are used more than 100 times or 1,000 times. But this is the average uh, among all those features. And we see it's not that easy that there's only this one spot where a certain feature is uh, used in the code, but in, in most of the cases, we have an average of 5 or 10. And we can look, uh, finally, uh, how many features do we have in a single annotation? So um, as uh, mentioned earlier, we can have an if statement where we have several features in there. Uh, so an annotation and the condition under which the source code is included might be 
related to several features and we see that this uh, kind of uh, can increase if we look at more features that we also have more features in a single annotation. In the second part of the lecture, we looked at granularity and that granularity at file level, as we've seen this from other technique, er, techniques earlier, is not sufficient. And the preprocessors facilitate, on the one hand, fine-grained variability, but also um, variability uh, within files, uh, fine-grained, but also compile time variability. A preprocessor that is widely applied in practice is the C preprocessor. And industrial systems like Linux, uh, the Linux kernel and other systems, uh, we looked at Linux already in the first part of the lecture, they are even combining different strategies. They are often combining preprocessors together with build systems, build systems to envision, uh, to realize the vision of features at file level and preprocessors to envision the or realize the uh, variability at uh, within files at statement level and so on. There's again some further reading in the book by Sven Appel and others. And uh, we do have a practical task for you. Um, the task is about antenna. So antenna is an in-place preprocessor which transforms the artifacts. And the question is, what are the benefits of using such an in-place preprocessor uh, and whether you see any drawbacks of this approach? The second task is um, the preprocessors that we've seen so far are only lexical preprocessors. So they consider the input, but it's just a stream of characters. Could you imagine that this can be done in another way uh, based on the underlying language? Uh, what would be advantages of such approaches? And then in the literature, there is the term call, uh, coined the if def hell what can be meant by this? We already talked about some drawbacks of if defs uh, of preprocessors. What could be meant with the if def hell? I hope that you enjoyed the lecture despite its length and hope to see you again for the next video.